Hello and welcome to the Little Knowledge Podcast, where this time we'll be talking about Saint-Pierre and its environs. Nowhere in France, not, not that yeah. exotic. We're going to, well, I don't know, Chepstow is quite a nice place, isn't it? Oh, I, I think it's exotic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Anyway, my name's Paul Busby and with me as ever is that well-known lover of Chepstow, Goth Morgan. <laughs> Hi, Goth. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Greetings to you all. Hope you're happy. And how are you? I'm okay. It's lovely and sunny and longer days, isn't it? We've had some smashing time. So I've enjoyed going out there, sitting on benches with cups of takeaway coffee and reading books and, and just getting up, getting the sun on my pallid body. It's been very nice. I think a lot of I, people have the same thing. I mean, I'm looking ever so slightly red here and a bit shiny because I was out. <laughs> it wasn't sunny yesterday, but I, I returned to Tradiga House yesterday, Goff. Um, a woo, and may I add, <laughs> excellent. That is fantastic. It only took a it? year, yeah. but uh, but yeah, oh, what a year! That's that's all yeah, right. It's nice, it's nice to see things. It's just a little way of hope that things are gradually, you know, opening up again a bit, taking it slowly but opening up, and that's nice. Absolutely. Well, we're going to start um, a mere stone's throw away from Tradiga House, which is something of home territory for both me and Goff, um, because this is where our story begins. And it begins in the 13th century. In this one, we're going to go back a fair bit, Goff, a lot far yeah. further back in the past than we have in some of our other videos. And, and Harad the Beautiful, according to a bard that her, her son paid, <laughs> Harad the Beautiful married. Um, mm. And they, uh, they uh, had children. And uh, the children are very interesting because... What we have here is this is spot the odd one out, by the way, Goff, of this line. OK, we've got yeah. three brothers that comes afterwards. And these are the brothers. You have Morgan Ap Llewellyn, Ivor Ap Llewellyn and Philip of Saint-Pierre. <laughs> <laughs> spot the he wasn't, try one. he wasn't trying, was he? <laughs> or trying a little too hard. One of the two. <laughs> what happened was the eldest son, uh, Morgan Ap Llewellyn, was the line of the Morgans of Tredegar, the famous yeah. Morgans, start from him. The second one, Ivor Ap Llewellyn, became known in the Eisteddfod to this day as Ivor Hyle, who is Ivor the Generous, and he lived at Werner oh, yeah. Klepper, yes. which is very close to Tredegar House. And we're following the third brother, Philip of Saint-Pierre. Philip of Saint-Pierre. Now, they're all apps at this point, of course, son of, as you see, yeah. you know, Morgan, son of Llewellyn, Ivor, son of Llewellyn. Um, but at one point, they, you know, you choose a surname. So they chose mm. the Morgans of Tredegar. And interestingly, a newspaper says that of the 52 branches that stem from this line, descendants of Caravor the Great, Lord of Duffid, this illustrious yeah. line, 50 of them chose Morgan as a surname. Good, good Lord. That's, a, <laughs> good well, Lord. That's astonishing, isn't it? Only two didn't, and one of them was the... Yeah. Rather stubbornly independent Lewises. Um, yeah. so they settled on Lewis, but it's the same, you know, it's the same. They're all um, yeah. of that line, you see, from and Harad Incredible. the Beautiful on. So this Saint Pierre bit, um, Saint Pierre in uh, near Chepstow, as we said earlier on. And if I just get up, here we are. This is Saint Pierre, uh, now a hotel and golf course. Yes. It's our second golf uh, club because we did the Hendra of uh, Rolls of Monmouth Golf Club a little while um, back. That's right. Now you've been here, golf, haven't you? Yes, I did. I, I, I attended a function there a long time ago in my in my Newport Town poet career, um, and we did an evening function there. My father and I went down uh, and attended a dinner. I think it was a headmasters. And I was a guest speaker, so I got uh, got you know, fed and watered in in, a, in, in the st some of the rooms there. But when you get there, when you approach it, you realise that it's a very very it's not a it's a it's a very ancient building, as you can tell, and it doesn't definitely seems to have some sort of ecclesiastic prior function as well, churches and chapels and various things. So I, I never knew much about the place, but it obviously realised that this is something of probably former religious grounds which was sold on as a house or whatever. Well, this is, uh, what we have here, of course, is the church. Yeah. St. Peter's Church or St. Pierre Church, very close <coughs> to the house. It was said that uh, you could, it's about 20 yards from the old kitchen of St. Pierre House. Hmm. 
So you just stagger. But it's not the first time we've seen this. Remember yeah. how close the church was to St. Donat's Castle? Yes. So having a church oh, yeah. or chapel nearby is not particularly unusual. But the Saint Pierre sort of thing isn't became a place, but originally appears to have been a family. Oh. Now, although Saint Pierre sounds, it must be Norman. They're not sure whether that's been altered over the years. But it was Pierre. Maybe it was a Welsh family. People think that uh, Piersfield may have come from the same thing. Piersfield. Oh, that's interesting. Pier so yeah, we're that's not. Interesting. We're not sure. We do know there was a family before the Lewises turned up called de Saint Pierre, and we knew they were there in the early 1300s. The Lewises turn up um, a little bit later on. Um, and in 1764, uh, they were put in foundations and digging around uh, Saint Pierre Church, and they came across a sepulchral stone which said on it, here lies Urien de Saint Pierre, who died in 1295. Great. So, and they, were, they owned land in Cheshire and they owned land in uh, Chepstow. Um, so this family, although we don't know as much about them as we'd like, uh, is mm. where everything appears to stem from uh, the so name. The, so, so this has absolutely no sort of monastic or ecclesiastical background at all? Not so, as such, not this site as not such. Not this no. site as such. No, well, no, that's, no. That's fascinating, isn't it? Because you would really look at it from the configuration and think this is former monastic property which was taken over and turned into a house like so many other places were. Like our like last one, Margam, yeah, like our yeah, last one, Margam. But it, no. looks like, it looks like that setup. Isn't that a wonderful puzzle in right? the, you know, this church is so close and bang on top of the property. But 12, good Lord, 12. Well, if you thought 1295 was interesting, this whole area um, sort of harkens back to legends and uh, mythology to a certain extent. Mm. But although we mustn't mix up history with legend, I always think legends tell us an awful lot about our history and should never be discarded. And this is a rather special area around here, around Chepstow, because I want to tell a little story. It fits into the bigger picture, so, so stay with me on this. We know that, again, we're not sure about the date, whether it's the late 500s or the early 600s. There was a man who lived uh, fairly nearby, or was in fact king of fairly nearby, called Tudrig. And Tudrig was king of Gwent and also what became Glamorgan. So King mm -hmm. of Gwent and Glamorgan. And after a while, he, uh, he abdicated for his son Merig, and he went to live as a hermit, which is a good retirement plan for a lot of saints, I find. They think, yes. <laughs> I'll become a hermit. <laughs> so Tudrig went off near Tintin to become a hermit, and at that point, the Saxons invaded. So they got the old man out of retirement mm -hmm. for one last battle. And Tudrig returned back and he fought against the Saxons and he was victorious in battle. But like Nelson at Trafalgar, he was mortally wounded at the moment of his ultimate victory. Uh, they think it might have been a lance to the head. Oh, gosh. It appears in the Book of Flandaff of the 12th century. Yeah. This, so it's a little hazy, but there, there seems to be something in it, you know. Hmm. And he wanted to be buried. He, wanted, he was dying. So he wanted to be taken to Flathome. He was going to die and flat home, you see, but he didn't get that far. He got as far as what we term today Mathen, so not yeah. far from Saint Pierre. And there he died, uh, but not before tending his wounds near a well that sprung up, which became the holy well of Tudrig. That he became a martyr because he was fighting the heathen Saxons. Mm. You see? Oh, he gosh, became a yeah. Christian martyr. And so what uh, what Merrick did <coughs> was he built a church. Where his father for his father's body mm -hmm. put the father's body there the holy well was there for many years and so the legend started of tudrig mm -hmm. the you know the king of gwent and the mm -hmm. future glamorgan that's all very well and you think well is this legend or is this myth or, or whatever um but many years later in 1615 at this church in mathen and mathen by the way originally was called mirtha tudrig Oh, that's interesting. The martyr. Yeah. And it became, yeah. it eventually became Mathen. Uh, and they were looking around. Bishop Godwin, who we will come back to later on, Bishop Francis Godwin in 1615, finds a stone coffin with an extremely old skeleton, exactly where the legends say Mary had put it. And the skeleton's in excellent condition, apart from a very clear wound to the skull. Oh, gosh. <laughs> interesting. 
It is interesting. So there's something in it, perhaps. Oh, there we are. There's two drig dying. It's always nice to have a harpist yeah. around when you're dying. Yeah, it's it's handy. Yeah, go out with a bit of music. It's nice. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, Goff. No, it's okay. Come on, come on, because I'll, I'll pick up at the end. I was going to say Fred Hando, that famous Newport headmaster and historian, in the 1940s went to the, to the church at Mathen and uh, was talking to an elderly lady who said that way back in 1881, when they were doing work on the chancel near the altar, they'd taken up the floor and she was an eyewitness to the stone coffin and said, oh, I remember it. She didn't know what Bishop Godwin had said, but she said, oh, I remember it because there was a skeleton in it and had a very clear hole in its skull. Oh, crikey, good Lord. So there might be something in it. And so they've got this in the church yeah. now, sort of marking it, explaining the various things. Yeah. And also the Holy Well is still there as well. Yeah. <laughs> now there's, right. an, there's an expert on Holy Wells called Janet Board. And I think she lives in North Wales now. And she said she's a little bit, she, she said it's very good of them to acknowledge it's there. I mean, I'm a little miffed that our own holy well closest to us, which was St. Gladys's well, I mm. couldn't tell you exactly where it is. So if any viewer is watching mm. this that knows where St. Gladys's holy well or St. Gladys's spring near Baysleg and Newport is, do let me know. But mm. she said it's a little bit municipal. It's not very romantic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So you see what she means. Yeah, you can walk down and have a dip and come back out again. <laughs> so this whole area is sort of awash with Tudrig yeah. and the original kings it's, of Gwent. And it's very Gwent. interesting with them um, finding the bones of Saint Tudrig, um, because particularly a bishop goes out and finds some bones of a saint. <laughs> and you have to remember that, you know, the, the, the deep cynic within me realised how important, you know, the, the, the relics business was. And having mm. uh, having the saint to uh, venerate in the saint's body, it, bishop turns out and find one and finds it. Oh, look! It's a skeleton and it's got a <laughs> hole in the head. And is it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'm not denying it probably was in 1881 a stone coffin with a skeleton with a hole in the skull. Mm. But I'd be quite suspicious about how so circumstances matched so neatly. Well, even more, of course. <laughs> it, of course, it was 1615 when. Uh... The Bishop yeah. uh, Godwin uh, found it, so you might be right. Um, yeah. It's but always it's a, a bit pokey, always a bit hokey. Anything to do? It's with kind of the way it goes. I need to show you really the area because it'll make more sense if we look at the absolute uh, the area of the place here, so we know what we're talking about. So here we are. We have Saint Pierre. Uh, here is Saint Pierre. If you can see. Oh yes. Oh, there's oh, there's Madame. There's Saint Pierre. Across the way is. St. Tudric's Church, and you've mm -hmm. got Mathen Palace as well that we'll come back to, and Moynes Court, which we'll also mm. talk about a little bit later on. And you've got three major places very close to each other, haven't you? You have, haven't you, there, yeah. And that might be because they were all trying to get a benefit from this, Saint Pierre Pill, which the oh. old, old history suggests that in the post-Roman era, this was one of the major ports of Britain according to the Welsh triads. So they Good say luck. that Sam, it was a lot bigger back then, mm. but access to the pill and access to the River Severn is probably what got them in this area, clustered these important buildings. Yeah. Right, let's get to Sam Pierre. We know the area now. Let's have a little look. Do, 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 do. Pum, pum, pum. There we are. There's the gatehouse, yeah. which we saw. Uh, you're right, the gatehouse is 16th century, possibly 15th century. Oh. So when the Lewises turned up, this has sort of been rebuilt by them mm. at the time. They think that the Saint Pierre house built by the Lewises was in about 1475, but there was clearly a building on the site before then. Mm. And then it was added to over the years. But uh, you remember Philip of Saint Pierre? Ah, uh, indeed. Who, yes. who can forget the magnificent Philip of Saint Pierre? <laughs> well, there's another legend that his son, Sir David Ap Philip, who we know did serve Henry IV and Henry V in France, may well have been close to Henry V and may have given Henry V a loan. Because it was said, and this is a legend, but it, was, it might have a little bit of truth, the crown jewels themselves of Henry V were kept at Saint Pierre as surety for the loans given the king by Sir David Ap Philip. 
Oh, that's intriguing. <laughs> now, I'm not so sure about that, but I, it does suggest that there must have been some surety. You can see how these legends... Yeah, so you can see how he might have had an item, but if not all of them. I mean, that's a possibility, and then it became all of them. But he might, might have had some form of um, royal regalia as surety. Yeah. <coughs> they settle on Lewis as a surname. And, oh, by the way, you go through this... Um, this wonderful gatehouse, mm. and you get to the house behind it. And here it is in later years, Saint-Pierre. Mm. There it is. And during the, uh, and the Lewis family never really got to the very top. They were a county gentry rather mm. than spanning, rather than empire builders. Mm. And this could be because they were so independent and seemed happy to do their own thing. The Lewises mm. didn't really play the game. <laughs> they, yeah, were, yeah, yeah. they just seem to do their own thing. Uh, yeah. Take the Civil War, for instance. Um, it was. Do you remember when we talked about it? it? Was at Chepstow Castle, and do you remember Sir Nicholas Chemist, the wrestler from Kevin oh, yes. Abley, the strongest yeah. man in the kingdom? Man that threw a donkey over the wall. Threw yeah. a donkey over the wall. What can yeah. you do, Goff? He can throw a donkey over a wall. Exactly. <laughs> Test of that was his party piece. But he made his final stand at Chepstow Castle, where he died heroically, of course, Sir Nicholas. There was a Lewis there at the time that wanted to negotiate. The Lewises <laughs> were the sort of people that would come up to you and think, well, are you really sure this is wise? <laughs> you know, let, let, let's, let's think about this uh, a little bit. So during the Civil War, one of the main, the main Lewis was a, a minor anyway, but the others were trying to sort of navigate this. They were royalists but they were trying to be reasonable about the whole thing. Uh, now, there was a passage nearby. You saw how close we were to the River Severn. Yes. And uh, I think the best way to show this, actually, is to get back to that little plan of ours. Okay, so here we are. We get to the Severn, and it's how you cross the River Severn. That becomes quite lucrative, of course. So we come down here to Black Rock, which is nearby. Yeah. Um, the Lewises ran a passage over the Severn, okay? Oh, right. Slightly north, in later years, the Duke of Beaufort ran one called Old mm. Passage. Uh, and I like to think that's a more respectable ferry service, well financed yeah. by the Duke of Beaufort. The Lewises have their own rival version here yeah. at Black Rock called New Passage. Mm. So they had those with the ferry, and the idea was you would go from Black Rock. And I love these names, the dumplings you would pass over. Oh, yeah. The scars, the old scars. man's head is down there. Yeah. And you go across to a uh, new passage. Redrick, there we are. New passage hotel. So this was the crossing. There's oh, also, of course, yeah. There's also Goblin Ledge. Oh, Goblin yeah. Ledge, isn't that lovely? Yeah. Problem old is, this key. is very dangerous. Old very key. dangerous. Yeah. It's more dangerous than the, than the Duke's one. And it didn't yeah. help that the Lewises quite often used, shall we say, not the most... Um, respectable of boatmen. <laughs> Always moaning about the surly and drunken boatmen of New Passage. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a Civil War um, story about this. Um, King Charles I uh, was in the area in 1645, and we know that's a fact, of course, Goff. Mm. We know some of the places, such as Repera Castle and yeah. Tredega House, that he stayed. And here we are. This is, you've got Wales over here. This is New Passage. And this is the ferry, the boat. Oh. Anyway, the story is King Charles I um, was fleeing and he fled. The boat took him back over to Gloucestershire and right on his tail were 60 armed parliamentarians. And they got to New Passage and by sword point, they ordered the boatmen to take them across. Now, the story is the boatmen were royalists and took them across as far as if we look across, that's the view. Yeah. It would have taken them across as far as the stones known as the English stones, which are here. Oh, yeah. I don't know why they just didn't take the second seven crossing. Quite frankly, <laughs> <didn't they? laughs> it would have been a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> and they landed them there and said, oh, it's all right. It's easily fordable, which it yeah. is if the tide isn't coming in, which it does very quickly. Yeah. Came in very quickly. All 60 parliamentarians were drowned. Good Lord. Well, well, well. <laughs> when Oliver Cromwell found out about this, he banned the new passage, oh, he abolished right. the ferry service. Oh, right. Oh, that's interesting. So, uh, <coughs> but just to keep on the Civil War, we've got a chap here called Henry Martin. This is Henry Martin. And Henry Martin 
was a parliamentarian and a regicide. Oh, wow. He signed the death warrant yeah. of King Charles the yeah. yeah. He was a man who was um, very sort of stubborn with his beliefs, but very loyal to his beliefs. So he did not believe one man should have power, which is quite an uncommon opinion back in the 17th century. Yeah. Um, and so he got quite unpopular with parliamentarians as well as royalists. He didn't fight in the Civil War, but he was a governor of a town. Mm. And he even said afterwards, he was one of the people who first said, well, I think we need to remove the king and his family. And he was the one talking actively about the death yeah. very early on of King Charles I. After it happened, he signed the death warrant. After it, he didn't trust Cromwell either because of oh, Cromwell's dictatorial. And it was yeah. said that he considered... There is a source that says he considered even the murder of Oliver Cromwell in later years. Oh, cranky. Yes, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's not a very passive dem Democrat, is he? <laughs> no, there's no passivity. He didn't get on with Charles I, who called him a bit of a ladies' man as well, uh, in inverted oh. commas. Charles I said that Henry Martin was an ugly rascal and a whoremaster. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> Having no seen the loss. portrait, you can sort of go along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Before we go, I've just struck, why is the word now written on that page? N-O-W, now. I have no idea. I don't know, actually. This isn't actually the portrait of Martin that I was looking for. There is another one, which was at Saint-Pierre but they're not entirely sure. So I haven't really looked into this portrait. I don't know. It's quite strange because he doesn't look like something that's an imprint on the picture. It's not random. It's definitely on the painting. Yeah. I shall look into that and report back, Goff. That's your, that's your homework. That's my yeah. homework. I shall try to do it. And so what happens if, you know what happens when Charles II comes back? If you're a regicide, you're in big um, trouble if you've signed yeah. that bit of paper, right? Oh, quite, yes. I, I, that stuck me at the beginning. <laughs> He's going to have a rotten time. <clears throat> Better than most, because he was arrested. He did have a trial. Um, but because he was he treated royalists so well, actually, during the protectorate, hmm. in the end, Charles II decided he would be sentenced just to imprisonment. Originally oh, at Windsor Castle, but he was fed up of looking at his face, quite frankly. He wanted him far <laughs> away. And yeah. so he sent him to Chepstow Castle, and he was kept in what is still called to this day Martin's Tower. Which is this? Oh, one. So I've heard of that the Martin's Tower at Chepstow Castle. I never realised associated with him. Oh well, well, that's interesting. Now the Lewises, people always willing to. Uh, they don't really have a grudge. The Lewises, they're always looking for accommodation. Uh, mm. They befriended Martin, and he was allowed to visit Saint Pierre. Oh gosh! Yeah. So he would go along, and, and yeah. one source suggests that his mum may have lived at Saint Pierre. Oh, all right. So you've got this. So they let. So what? What Martin did was he left a portrait hmm. to the Lewises, which hmm. hung at Saint Pierre for many, many years. Uh, interesting with portraits, though. Goff. They also had a miniature of Charles the Second, which is fine. But have you got yeah. your Jacobite South Wales bingo card with you, Goff? <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> because they also had a miniature at Saint Pierre of Bonnie Prince Charlie. So we have another Jacobite South Wales aristocratic household. It's interesting, though, with having the both. They sort of like it shows the independence of this family, isn't it? They actually did. <laughs> they have one of each. <laughs> well, in a way, yeah. Either I mean, we haven't made our mind up yet, or we're not really interested in either of them. <laughs> well, they're a very likable family that just seem to yeah. get on with everyone. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so Martin lived for about nearly 20 years at Chepstow with, you know, little dinner parties at St. Pierre. <laughs> it's very Rudolf Hess, that, isn't it? Being allowed yeah. out for walks and, you know. Yeah. I don't yeah. think Hess went out for dinner parties, but certainly Martin <laughs> went out. Um, so, yeah, so that I, I found that quite interesting, the way the Lewises sort of navigated mm. the Civil War and that sort of thing. Now, navigation, they've lost the new passage, if you remember. Yes, it lost the new passage. Very unfortunate. But, you know, 60 dead parliamentarians. I mean, they, you know, it could have been worse for them, couldn't it? Mm. But they got it back and it went to chancery. So we're in the early 1700s and the Lewises want to bring back the new passage. And the Duke of Beaufort doesn't want that, obviously, because it takes well, custom right. away from his old passage a few miles north. And when you think of a big case in high chancery, I don't know about you, Goff, but I think of London and all the bells and whistles. Yeah, yeah. This particular because... high chancery case, 
was heard at the Elephant Coffee House in Bristol. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I think we've lost something since we stopped held it, holding legal legal things in pubs. Maybe we've lost a certain charm of that of the of, of British legal system, haven't we? There's no more coroners pop up in the pubs. And I was sorry, I know Carol Casey will have to in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, they get it back, you see. They get back the new passage, much to the Duke of Beaufort's disgust, or the guardians of the Duke of Beaufort. He was a child when this uh this uh, high chancery case went on. So they've got their, so the boatmen get their jobs back, you know, new boatmen just as drunken and disreputable as they were before. <laughs> and off they go. But it's still this very dangerous place. It's the kind of place that you look out on a dark winter's evening and you look at the choppiness of the seven and you look at the drunken swaying of the boatmen. And you probably <laughs> think, should we take the long way around? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Only would build a bridge. <laughs> crossing, if you will. <laughs> yes, but there were terrible, there were accidents. Obviously, there were accidents. If we go here, this is the old Black Rock Hotel. So this is the Welsh side of the New Passage. Now, in, on the, um, in the 40s, Fred Hando went here as well. And he looked at the windows on the porch, which you can't really see on this picture. Mm. Uh, and they were elliptical. And he said, that's strange. So he went up to the lady behind the bar and he said, what, what, what's with those very strange windows in the porch? She said, well, stand this way. When you stand this way and look at them and the windows line up, they're lenses. So you could be at the bar, you could look through the lensed windows and it would magnify the other side of the crossing, the new passage. Oh, good Oh, well, 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 well. There's a built-in telescope. A built-in telescope. So you Amazing. Can see your destination. Yeah. We'll see if someone's coming, I suppose. Yeah, we'll see if someone's coming as well. When the, when the, oh, the, but it will be in in a moment. Let's get ready. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Rupera Castle, a place we will talk about on a later podcast, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. A place we both know very well. On November the 8th, 1774, John Morgan of Rupera Castle was settling down to write a letter to his brother Charles. And in it, he writes about a key he's lost in a cupboard somewhere. And these very mundane things, you know. <laughs> but he also writes of the latest news in the area. And he writes, a report prevails, which I hope is not true, but one of the new passage small boats overturned, in which several passengers all drowned, and amongst them, one of the young Lewises of Saint-Pierre. Oh, and gosh. later on, I have just been told that six of the seven people in the small boat were drowned including Master John Lewis. Gosh. Very dangerous. Yeah. Um, and he might have been referring to something that was unfortunately even worse because there were two Lewises lost. And we actually have an account of what happened, which is fascinating. Oh, God, yeah. So this is it. A sudden gust of wind blew off the hat of the, the passenger. So the Lewises weren't seen as passengers, nor were the boatmen. There was one passenger yeah. of the but, seven yeah, yeah. <laughs> A gust of wind blew off the hat of the passenger, who insisted that they should endeavour to recover it. The rowers declared that they did not dare to alter the course of the boat in these conditions mm. without endangering her and sinking. The passenger, however, was resolute in his demands and proceeded to seize upon the tiller. A scuffle ensued. The boat lost its management, was swamped and went down. Oh, One of the boatmen only was saved by swimming ashore. The four others perished. Some days after, the hat was cast ashore when it was discovered that it belonged to a commercial traveller and had a quantity of banknotes sewn into the crown of it. Oh, Hence gosh. the anxiety of the owner to recover it. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> you know, that's, that does make ex explain why he was desperate to get his hat back. Dear <laughs> me. Full of banknotes. Good grief. But it's, I mean, this, this new, I mean, it was dangerous. Our friend Charles Wesley, who was either on the way to Fonmon Castle, and if you haven't watched our Fonmon Castle video, please do. Fonmon Castle uh, grounds have reopened now, by the way, if you're watching oh. it close to its, uh, its... So do go along. So he was almost lost. In later years, you had a steamboat. One of the first steamboats from Newport did the new passage in 1825, 30 turn, and it was named Saint-Pierre. Uh, unfortunately, the Duke of Beaufort threw money at the problem and gave Old Passage faster boats and a pier 
better peer and the Lewises didn't. Hmm. The old passage started taking over. And what finished off completely was when the Seven Tunnel was built in 1886. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah, yeah. Once you've got that, that was the yeah. end of the new passage. And then nice little learner of the Lewises, yeah. however dangerous it might be. Yeah. And it must have impacted on old passage ultimately as well, isn't it? Because you just, well, it was a train ferry. You got on one side, got off the other. Oh, yeah. <coughs> finished, finished old passage as well. So the Duke was yeah, equally uh, annoyed. So here we are. What mm. I like about this, golf is I found this. It appears to have appeared in some form of calendar. Oh, yeah. April. Saint Pierre, Pierre, Mr. Lewis's. <laughs> now, I don't know if this, do you think this is uh, maybe the lich gate of the church, which no longer exists, maybe? Yeah. So I can't work out what that is. And it does look like a lich gate, doesn't it? Yeah. There's a better view of the house itself, Saint Pierre, behind its, uh, hmm. its gatehouse. And like I said, the, I mean, th these Lewis's were never going to be peers. They were never hmm. going to be baronets because they were just so stubbornly independent. Mm. They were rarely even MPs. But in the 18th century, Thomas mm. Lewis did become an MP for a while. The Duke of Beaufort got him elected. Now, if the Duke of Beaufort gets you elected, he wants something, right? Yeah, quite. So the Lewises take his patronage, take his money, get elected, and then do whatever they want to. In <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting more and more fond of these as they go on. <laughs> The Duke of Beaufort <laughs> termed this uh, erratic voting record as several accidents on the part of Mr. Lewis. <laughs> and in the end, he withdrew his patronage because he said, the great expectation I had of Mr. Lewis does not answer. <laughs> but as they have these kind of whims, even at Care Went, okay, they were doing a, a 19, early 19th century, late 18th century dig at Care Went. And they find near a, a cottage owned by the Lewis estate, the San Pierre estate, this magnificent mosaic pavement, beautiful pavement. Mm. It was discovered in an orchard behind a farmhouse and a building. The Lewis's erected a building to shelter it from the weather. By oh, order gosh. of Mr. Lewis yeah. of San Pierre. But then after a little while, the Lewis brew house needed a roof. And this being of similar dimensions was transferred to the brew house. <laughs> so there are limits, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what we haven't had for a while? I think we've only had it once and that was Pontypool Park, where a juicy hermit. Oh yeah, yeah, a resident hermit. Have we got, oh. We have one here, 1821. Oh, <laughs> and there's a lovely account of him. A fortnight since, well, it's an accidental hermit, really. A fortnight yeah. since, two men at work in the grounds of Colonel Lewis at St. Pierre, Monmouthshire, were surprised at the appearance of a column of smoke arising from the middle of some very thick coppice. Upon further scrutiny, they discovered an aperture which conducted them into an excavation where they discovered a being scarcely of this world, <laughs> in appearance at least. His body was scarcely covered with the remnants of former habiliments and a beard almost patriarchal. On being questioned, nothing satisfactory was gathered. And except stating that he had not been a resident of this cave more than three months, no answer could be obtained. So they did what you expect them to do, Goff. His first discoverers made a penny of their hermit, as they termed him, by exhibiting him at a public house in Chepstow. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <For> sake. <laughs> <laughs> it's not great, is it really? This poor guy. <laughs> yes, please, I just leave me in my cave. No, no, get out here being a big penny. Just come and have a look at you. It's oh, worse dear. than that, actually, because after it appears the initial money making scheme, <laughs> Colonel Lewis uh, had him declared a rogue and a vagabond and sent him to prison. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> do you yeah, think that's the, do you think that's the hermit equivalent? <laughs> is that the hermit equivalent of melting down your your uh, wax mannequin at Madame Tussauds when you're yeah. on <laughs> popular? They're like, oh, novelty's worn off of this now. <laughs> Chuck him in prison. Oh, yeah. dear me. Oh. Well, you know, 
But this family didn't have an enormous estate. They had a very wealthy one, and they owned some important buildings. At various times, they owned Penhow Castle. They owned Caldecott Castle for a short period. Oh, so the Lewis estate, they were happy with what they had, and they were quite a wealthy county gentry, yeah. I suppose you'd call them. They even inherited land in Herefordshire, a place called Abbey Door in Golden Valley, and they were involved with the Golden Valley Railway. So they oh, were still making yeah. money. And they also bought Moynes Court, which we're going to go on to in a little while. And, mm. and some people say Moynes Court might have been Monk's Court. Because remember when uh, we lost our King of Gwent and Glamorgan in the early 1600s, Tudor? Yeah. Well, Merrig, as a gift, gave the land around there to uh, the Bishopric of Landaff. Wow. The Bishop of Flandaff used to live in Mathen at the palace oh, right. in Mathen. And we do actually have the palace of Mathen here, the Bishop's Palace. It has an interesting little history because it became very uh, run down because it was turned into a farmhouse after a oh, while. Right, yeah. And the kitchen was turned into a stable, if you can believe that. Really? But it was restored by a man who worked for Country Life, a guy called Tippin. Uh, in the 19th century, and uh, it looks like that today, the Bishop's Palace. Oh, gosh. Very That's impressive. Building. We can have a little look inside, if you like. Yes, go on. Oh, look at that. For a place that was once, you know, derelict, yeah. they've done a wonderful job. And I love this, because this used to be the billiards room, and yeah. they no longer have a billiards table. They have the scoreboard, and they still have the lighting. Oh, yeah, yes, <laughs> well, the dining table. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Bishop's Palace brings us on to a fascinating character, a man who lived at Moynes Court, which we'll come up to soon, and may have rebuilt Moynes Court and lived at the Bishop's Palace, the Bishop of Landaff, who we have mentioned, and you were quite sceptical about him, Francis Godwin, finder of skeletons in 1615. Uh, there he is. Oh, no, now there's a man that can wear puffy sleeves. He certainly You've got to give him his due. <laughs> Not only can like Francis Godwin... He with a beard, doesn't he? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He can wear puffy sleeves, he can redesign country houses, he can be the Bishop of Landaff, and he can create one of the first works of science fiction. What a man. Really? He was a, a distant relative of his, was actually your, one of your heroes, Goff Jonathan Swift. Oh, yeah, oh, well, yeah I love Swift. S some people think Swift got some of his inspiration from Godwin. Because oh, Godwin right. wrote a book called The Man in the Moon. Ah. an E on it. What happens is someone's trying to escape and they uh, they find this sort of, uh, these beasts that look like swans that can fly you and it flies our hero to the moon. Hmm. It takes 12 days and it flies to the moon and a lot, of, and actually in all seriousness, it shows that he's read Galileo. Hmm. It also shows that he has some idea of gravity. Oh, because they get to the moon and the gravitational pull is different. And this is in the 1620s. That's very interesting. Now, what is it? It's, it's just an interesting thing when you look at this because we, we're looking at these. There were lots of early um, pieces of what we call speculative fiction, now the, the early science fiction type things. And one of the other sources they think for um, uh, uh, Swift, particularly Gulliver's Travel, was actually done by um, Serrano de Bergerac, who yes. wrote also. A, tra a travel to a voyage to the moon, the voyage to the sun. So it'd be interesting to know which voyage to the moon came first. Whether this it was one the did. Bishops or... ah. This one did because the Bergerac also, it suggested, could have taken inspiration from our local lad here, Francis Godwin. Yeah. So those, though, they, they all sort of, oh, well, that's very interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, he, he could be the progenitor of both of them. And of course, in Serrano de Bergerac, a lot of Ber Bergerac feeds into some parts of Swift as well. Hmm. It's interesting that Swift got so aggravated at people writing additional stories, additional Gulliver stories, when he was blatantly ripping off so many other pieces of work <laughs> yeah. at the same time. Because there was no copyright didn't really exist at this period, the idea of copyright on text. No. How, how, inter how very interesting. <clears throat> so if you've got your bishop staying at the palace, at Mathen Palace, it is Moynes Court that was next to it and near Saint-Pierre. You can see another place with a big gatehouse. Mm. You can see here, it seemed to be the style of the time, but this is a lot older than the San Pierre gatehouse. And by the way, you can now rent this gatehouse as a holiday home. Oh, hey. Get for the Welsh gatehouse on yeah. the internet, you can actually stay at Moynes Court gatehouse. But actually, all this Monk's Court stuff, 
where a bishop's friends would be put up there nearby. There was actually a family called Moines way back ah. in the day. Mm. And there was clearly mm. another house, an older house, possibly a castle on this mm. site. And this is about 13th century. So a lot mm. older than the Saint-Pierre gatehouse. Mm. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the house itself, you can see here, does have 1609 uh, commemorated on it, which was when Bishop Godwin leased it. So right. it does have a strong link to Moynes Court. It looks rather moody here, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a better picture of it slightly later on. Hmm. But actually, we do know during the Civil War, this was actually leased by uh, one of the Hughes brothers' interesting story, a Thomas Hughes, who was a parliamentarian and governor of Chepstow. His brother Charles was a keen royalist. So, oh, it, so oh, what right. happened? But they didn't fall out over no. it, oddly. What happened was when Parliament, during the Protectorate, Thomas looked after his brother Charles the Royalist, and during the Restoration, mm. Charles looked after his brother Thomas the Parliamentarian. Oh, <laughs> interesting. So that was the, that was the yeah. brother's, uh, brother's yeah. home, you see here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, Moynes Court's an interesting place. I'd like to show something before we do a little bit more on Moynes Court. I love this because this has got a lot of the places that we've talked about. If I can just, what you have here is 11 properties in the area. Oh, gosh. So they've all got sort of numbers. You've got Mathen yeah. Church, you've got Moynes Court up here. Where is, ah, there we are. You follow them. I like the fact they call St. Tudric, St. Treacles. St. Treacles. St. Treacles <laughs> Church. You've got, a lot, uh, a lot treacle. <laughs> I mean, we've done this place. We've got Pierce Field here. Yeah. Oh, yes. And we go all the way along and uh, you've got Moynes Court. You have Saint-Pierre there with its very familiar gatehouse. Oh, here's Saint-Pierre, actually. Yeah. This is Moynes Court. And it's all sort of added on. You've got Tintin over here. Yeah. Mathen, I, Mathen Palace. I'm Bishop interested Palace. in that building um, with the tower. That's a watchtower there, isn't it? And that's a watchtower, yeah. Yeah, okay. interesting. We're used to seeing these properties with coastal watchtowers, aren't we? Yes, yes, we've seen that quite a bit, haven't we? Well, particularly around Glamorgan area, we saw we saw that in our Glamorgan properties. That's it. That's the first watchtower we've seen in um, uh, Gwent, however. Certainly this, certainly this area, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, it is actually, isn't it? It's the first Monmouthshire watchtower we've had. You're quite right, Goth. Yeah, we haven't I seen thought, one about it. I thought that was interesting. This is one. Yeah. It's almost Bronte-esque, isn't it? This is Moynes yes. Court as it lives today. I should say this is a photograph taken by Adam Nick, the author, who based one of his books on Moynes Court. And the reason we're talking about Moynes Court isn't because of Bishop Godwin. It's actually mm. because the Lewis family owned it. It was kind of passed mm. along around the various owners of the area, Moynes Court. They bought mm. it in 1698. They got it back in the 19th century. And for some reason, in the late 19th, early 20th century, the Lewis family decided to move from Saint-Pierre to Moynes Court. It's so oh. close, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Is that downsizing? Is that upsizing? Why are they moving just over the hill? Yeah. Well, how interesting. Very strange. But I'll just need to wrap up uh, the, uh, this little bit of it, actually, mm. because the Lewises are finally running out of children. They're running oh. out of male heirs by this point. And, and people are saying, in fact, calling the last one who was living at Moynes Court and at Abbey Door the last of the Morgans. Oh, ah, ah, yeah. Because That's the line. Yeah. yeah. So from Philip, you know Goff, uh, Philip of Saint Pierre. Yeah. That's yeah. where we started. They were all one family. Yeah. And you know, the Morgans of Tredegar themselves, Lord Tredegar, did actually die out in the male line in 1792. Uh, of course, yes. That's right. Yeah. So the only male line descendant from that and all the way back to Cadavaud the Great that they knew of was mm. this Louis of Saint-Pierre, and he's the only one left. Oh, gosh. So it's getting a little bit hairy. He's the last of the Morgans. That's what newspapers refer to him. Yeah. Never mind the name Thomas uh, Frank Lewis. He's known as the yeah. last of the Morgans. And his wife dies in 1899. He's in his 70s. He has no children. And it looks like that's it. So where does it go? Where does this mm. 80,000 pounds estate go? Where does Sam Pierre go? Well, his sister married one of your heroes, Goff, married into the Prothero family of Malpas Court, Mary oh, Lewis. Oh, right. 
So all of this was going to go into the hands yeah. of the Prodoros of Malpas Prodoros. Court. Gosh. <laughs> well, and there's no well. way it, he, he isn't married. Yeah. There's no children. There's no uncles we don't know about. The Protheros, Francis Thomas Edgerton Prothero of Malpas Court, is rubbing his hands with glee in Edwardian times. Yeah. He is going to un- inherit this vast, ancient, historical estate. And sure enough, on December the 13th, 1908, Francis, uh, uh, sorry, the Thomas Frake Lewis dies aged 77. Okay. And he has his funeral at Old St. Pierre Church. Hmm. And afterwards, they read the will, and they did actually read the will. You said it uh, oh, yeah. this time, yeah. and it turns out he'd had a secret marriage, and there's a son <laughs> who's going to inherit everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh! I bet the brothers were happy. <laughs> oh dear! I bet me, the they... ravens were flying from the rafters on that night. <laughs> he kept it secret, and none of his family knew. <laughs> but he said you must have been blind not to know that I'd remarried. I was yeah with Julia. I have me and Julia. You must have been blind. Well, clearly the Protheros weren't close to him. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. didn't know. But yes, he had actually, and uh my goodness, as far as well, he was in his early this is almost Charlie Chaplin-esque. He was in mm-hmm. his early 70s when he met Julia Morgan, a farmer's daughter in Hereford, who was in her late 20s. Blimey. And they had two children, daughter and a son, Archibald uh, Morgan Lewis. Hmm. And it was kept covered up. And I think I know the reason why when you look at the dates. Hmm. Because his wife dies, his first wife dies in 1899. The daughter is born in 1898. Oh, <laughs> And he doesn't oh. marry in a Fulham church until after that of course and after mm. the death of his wife so that's the reason it's a secret because his wife mm. is dying and he's yeah. having an affair with the farmer's daughter in hereford <laughs> yeah yes, yes. yeah quite <laughs> violet her name was violet 1898 she was born mm. uh but anyway no that's it you can't do anything about it brother rose mm. it's perfectly true and archibald uh interestingly archibald lewis inherited saint pierre and moines court and everything like that and i found out that he died in 1987 but I don't oh, know if he had children. Oh, right. Because if he had a male child, that means there is someone out there. And if it's you, please let us know who yeah. really is the next Morgan. The layer, the last of the Morgans. Oh, my God. The current last of the Morgans. And well, the well, official well. one. The official the, one. Yeah. You know, not, not illegitimate or anything like that. Because no, again, Archibald, it was Archibald, Archibald Morgan Lewis. Remember, they were they're, they're keeping their, their, their Morgan descent going. And Archibald oh. was born after the secret marriage to Julia yeah. Morgan, the farmer's daughter. So he is legitimate. Yeah. He is a real Morgan, a real Lewis, that sort of thing. So I thought that's a fascinating way of it. Yeah. <laughs> but Moines Court was fascinating. I mean, we had interesting people staying there. I mean, Captain Lawrence Oates was there in 1910. The famous oh, Captain Oates. Yeah, Captain Oates. Yeah. I'm going outside now. I might be some time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gosh, I mean, Scott. Yeah. He enjoyed staying there. Uh, And there was a a guy, a young man called David Wanklin, who was actually the most successful Allied submariner of the Second World War. And he was here as a young boy and a sailor in the First World War had come from Newport. And his his, his boat had been um, fixed in Newport, repaired in Mm. Newport. And he turns up at Moynes Court uh, and there's little David around. Mm. And David comes up to him and says, are you a pirate? (laughs) <laughs> and the man explains what he did and that in that made david want to join the royal navy and oh, he got gosh. the victoria cross and so uh, you know a lot happens gosh, at moines yeah. court and if we fast forward goff to the second world war just before uh, david mm. goes uh, actually dies during the, the war mm. here is one of the great family names herbert of monmouthshire a catholic family yes. a brigadier general edmund herbert is living at Moynes Court. Mm. Now he had, did he not, a rather extraordinary daughter as well to add to the story. Yes. Oh yeah, this is fascinating. Because uh, it's part of those that history of, um, of the Second World War and those things which were just left and kept kept hidden, uh, out of view, etc. cetera. Uh, here she is. Um, oh. Can we see her? I'm yes, get, yes. I'll bring her up a little bit. It's not a terribly hot photo. 
but yeah, because it's a little bit small. But again, it's a wonderful period feel to it, isn't it? Mm. This is Mary Catherine Herbert, who mm. was the brigadier's daughter. Um, and she was a member of special, the Special Operations Executive uh-huh. during the war, SOE. You may have heard of SOE, but basically they were essentially agents who were dropped into enemy territory and worked with local resistance. She was particularly dropped into France um, and where she, um, she conducted sort of espionage and sabotage and, and various things like this. She operated mostly as a courier where she traveled around uh, on bicycle and in train and delivering various parts and delivering letters and keeping everything to going. Very educated woman. She had a university degree in art and she spoke French, Spanish, Italian, German, and Arabic. So it was mm. a very, very you know, a polyglot, as we say. Um, and she was working at the outbreak of the war in the British embassy in Warsaw. Um, she was a civilian translator of the air ministry eventually. And then she joined the WAF um, in 1941 as a, a general duty as an intelligence clerk. Uh, but eventually she was, re- she was released at her own request so she could join SOE in March 1942. Um, she's the first WAF officer to actually volunteer for SOE. Now, this is an incredibly brave thing. The life expectancy of SOE agents was something like a fortnight. Oh, really? Gosh. Oh, yeah. And if, you, if they got you, you were dead. You know, basically, you weren't. There was no question about it. It was an incredibly risky and an incredibly brave thing to actually do and she was actually 39 at the time she wasn't a, a young a young woman mm. um she was old, older than the average female agent at the time she was rather tall she's very slender very fair hair a very religious person um but she had the rather uncomplimentary virtue in the uh, soe's uh, point of view that she was considered inconspicuous ah very handy <laughs> mm, very handy but not terribly complimentary Okay, no. she said she trained as a courier, um, but with some, passing, with some other very famous names. She trained with uh, Odette Samson, the famous Odette, um, mm. and also with a, a person who subsequently becomes important to the, the story, Elise de Bézac, who was uh, um, obviously based uh, a French uh, SOE agent. Um, so she basically she was dropped into, she traveled by submarine to Gibraltar, and then by Felucca, which is a, a, a boat, um, to France, where she landed on the southern coast of France on the 31st of October 1942. She then went on to Cannes, where she met other agents, and then went on to train to Bordeaux, where she met um, Claude de Bézac, who was leader of a, something called the Scientist Network of SOE. There are different types of networks in the network, which organized armed resistance groups and intelligence operations in southern France. Uh, so she was a courier, basically traveling around, say, bicycle train, liaising with all these different groups, <coughs> carrying messages and documents, etc. There's a wonderful part. At one point, she was smuggling in um, radio parts, very heavy radio parts in a suitcase, which oh. she was smuggling to get on a train. And a very polite and refined German officer actually helped her on board with it, which is very <laughs> so slightly scandalous. You see, she had a, uh, an affair relationship with Claude de Bézac. Um, and actually became pregnant uh, by him, which she kept hidden. She didn't tell him. Um, And it only came out, eventually, the scientist network was was exposed. Hundreds of people were arrested, civilians, all the agents were captured. Um, And Claude de Bézac decided to fled to England, taking his sister, Lise de Bézac, who was also an agent, with him. And this left her stranded basically in France, having to go more or less into hiding, but also pregnant. So um, some people were very outraged that, he, you know, that he'd left her and taken his sister, but actually he didn't even know that she was expecting a child. Um, she is one of the only SOE officers ever to have actually had a child on active service while it was going on. Oh. Um, mm. So eventually, they, she, so eventually they, the, the SOE found out about this. They, put a, they ordered to stop all the clandestine activities. And they probably placed her in a nursing home in the suburbs of Bordeaux, where she could have her, her child, a daughter called Claudine, who was born in early December 1943. And then she and her daughter left the nursing home and moved into an apartment in Poitiers that had belonged, uh, been rented by Lise de Bézac, Claude Bézac's sister. Mm. 
This was not a good idea subsequently as it turned out, because the Germans discovered that Lise de Bézac had been an agent and thought that uh, uh, Herbert was, in fact, her. So they go in and they take Mary and they take her in, offer interrogation. They're convinced that she's Lise uh, de Bézac. She tells them that she doesn't. She doesn't know anything about them. She was very incredibly stoical under in interrogation, kept to her cover story, denied that she knew her, said that her accent in French was because she lived in Egypt and spoke Arabic. Um, <laughs> and she protested her innocence that she knew nothing of the woman. And eventually they did. They put her into a, a Gestapo prison. Uh, we kept in solitary confinement for a while. But otherwise, she was, she wasn't very badly, badly treated. Um, there. He said the prison was very clean and the inmates had a, a bath every Saturday. So oh. that's not very, you know, still, I still want to have the Gestapo to have my hands on me. But eventually, after a couple of months, they let her go because they did more or less accept her story that she wasn't least a Bezac, which is provable, but also they accepted that she didn't know her, she wasn't part of it the very, and they let her out, gave her her belongings, except for a ring. So rather pluckily, she went back the next day to the prison and said, I haven't got my ring. Can I have my ring, please? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she was issued the ring with an apology from the Gestapo for having not given her the documentation back properly. I mean, something says about the Gestapo, isn't it? They <laughs> wanted to keep the records tidy. Yeah. You know I mean? um, however, when the Gestapo had taken her, they'd left her daughter, Claudine, um, just with a maid. Um, and so the French social services took over Claudine and put her into an orphanage. And it took her a long time to track her down, but a, a, in a convent. And she persuaded the nuns that she'd been arrested unfairly and she event, and she then eventually got her back. Now, for the rest of the war, then, she, well, she went into hiding hmm. um, in a house near Poitiers. Well, I said hiding, she just lived remotely out of the way. Um, after the, lib the liberation of France, Claude and Lise de Berjac came back and they were then part of a, a mission to try and track down all these lost and captured SOE agents. Hmm. The goalless disappeared. I mean, that, there were hundreds of people who had worked for them, French people who had helped them as part of the resistance, all of whom had lost contact with SOE and were just stranded in France, basically. So Claude de Berjac eventually managed to track her down um, they found her living, she'd been living in uh, um, Poitiers and they found her, they found the daughter and then they returned to England together and uh, yeah, um, Mary and, and Claude eventually married on the 11th of November 1944 but it was a marriage really of propriety only and they never actually lived together uh, divorced eventually in 1960 and she bought uh, a small house in Frant a little village in Sussex and she gave French lessons for a living. Huh. And her daughter, Claudine immigrated to, emigrated to the United States, married an airline pilot. And yeah, Mary Catherine Herbert, um, after this incredibly exciting life, passed away in 1983 um, yeah, of pneumonia, sadly. So she lived ooh, a long time after the war, almost 40 years after oh, wow. she came back to me. Um, so she must have been in her early 80s, really. I can't quite remember when she died. I can't remember her birth dates. Mm. Uh, yeah, she was born in 1903, and she, she was 80. She died in 1983. Um, wow. Now, she got the Croix de Guerre from France, but for some reason, unlike many of her SOE colleagues, she received no British award whatsoever. Oh, that's a bit harsh, isn't it? Yeah, I wonder whether it was the, the, the sort of scandal associated with oh, having had a child. So they decided be. that. But I think it's a very, very... Very shoddy. Trivial, it's a very trivial thing to be so uptight about nowadays we don't care about that sort of thing at all and really if there's any 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 uh, any case for someone having to have a posthumous award it's i think it probably should be her in my mm. so mm. yeah fascinating that incredibly brave people to do this i mean again how to, to get your life was on the line all the time with it yeah so, yeah i haven't read it but i think she's mentioned in a book published relatively recently called churchill's angels about the oh, female agents, but she yeah. seems to have been a, a pretty major one. And I do know oh, that yeah. after the war, she did go back with her dad to Moyne's court for a spell on her own. Oh, right. Which again yeah. sheds light on this marriage. But again, yeah. you know, oh, yeah, it was, it was a marriage in name only. It was a marriage in name only. Now, I think she was there until the brigadier died in 1946. So, yeah, 
you know. So Moynes Court was always passed about among people, mm. um, but a colourful place. And now Moynes Court mm. actually in the 50s was divided up into two properties. So it's not right. actually called Moynes Court anymore, but yeah. I'm, I'm old fashioned. <laughs> so, he does it. so what happens to Saint Pierre once it's sort of abandoned by the Lewis's yeah. blasts of the Morgans? There's a, a little uh, fuzzy picture of Saint Pierre as it was uh, mm -hmm. during that time. Well, it gets leased out. Mr. Campbell Corey had it for a while, but his wife did not like the low lying nature of the house. It upset her constitution. So he moved out and Major Stacy moved in. And in 1925, it was sold. So oh. Archibald must have been old enough to make the decision. And mm. Saint Pierre was sold to a name to conjure with in this part of the world when it comes to steelworks and ironworks. Mm. Uh, sold to Daniel Lysett. Oh, because Lord, yeah. And well, he, yeah. Uh, oh. he was there right up until the Second World War when it was used. Isn't it strange? Its position, of course, is so close to the Seven Gough. Mm. But Saint Pierre House was used in World War II by Bristol Corporation. To, for the homeless during the bombing. If you've lost your house in heavily bombed Bristol, oh, gosh. This, they How got a chance of living at Saint Pierre. Well, well, well. Which is uh is it interesting, I suppose. Well, yeah, it? I find that's quite that's quite fascinating, isn't it? Uh, I, mean, I never I never would have uh, you, you you don't think about that that sort of um, you know there's a housing problem with so many people losing their homes, but you get so used to people like, you know, um be, uh, the military taking over these properties, but not these hmm over for civilian mm. civilian use and domestic use how interesting well what you do with a place like this after the war well um it was it was the home for the national association of boys clubs between 1945 oh. to 1958 and we've got a wonderful oh. little image here look at this <laughs> this is Saint Pierre. Oh, hey. <laughs> and there are all the pupils happily beating the living daylights out of each other <laughs> yes it was potential a potential boys time. club le leaders it's yeah. the leaders training for the boys clubs. <laughs> so it's Happily. clearly there you can see the Company gatehouse. Yeah. Oh, the church along here and you've got Saint Pierre. It's it's recognizable, isn't it? And there they all are beating the dickens out of each other. <laughs> it's good for the spirit. Yeah. Uh, after that, it was bought in 1960 by Bill Graham, who owned Tinton Hotels Limited. So, you know, he wanted to turn it into a into a hotel, yeah. it would seem at that time. Um, and it opened as a golf club in 1962. So basically, the old Deer Park became the golf course. Right. Which was... Uh, yeah, I've only ever known it as the golf course. Yeah. Because obviously, I, I built 1960, so I've felt my life it's been the golf course. Of course. And uh, we can now see... It's now a Marriott Hotel. And it's mm. been restored and all sorts. There we are. That's a familiar view today, isn't it? Yes. If we have a little look inside, and there it is. You can see now the problem is, of course, a lot of building for this hotel has been done. So, yes, yes you can say there is a lot of, you know, 19th century at Saint Pierre, oh, yeah. bit of 18th, oh, yeah. bit of 17th, a lot function of 19th. Room, function room I was talking about is that one you can see there with the patio windows at the back of the building. Oh, this one? Yeah. Yeah. That was the function room I appeared in years ago. In fact, if you go up there, the house used to have a courtyard in front of it, separating it from the gatehouse. But in the 1970s, mm. they built their reception in that area. Yeah. So it basically, so you can't really see the ground floor of Saint Pierre Manor House from no. the front. No, no, you I thought you could see it around here at least. Mm. Oh, there we are. That's a better view of it, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. You can see it around here. It was it was tinkered with. I don't know how much 15th century stuff, if anything, is left. To be honest, golf. There's yes, a lot of like, 19th century rebuilding the Lewises did to this property. Yeah. They weren't sentimental, some of these aristocratic families, were they? It was their house, well, not a museum. Exactly, there was their house. They, there was a, they, they, they were living organic properties in a way. They weren't kept in aspect. No. In a way, the fact that something's been tacked on the back or changed, I mean, it, it happens. That, that's, you know, it's the fact that the building and the place still exists is, is, is triumph enough, really. Certainly it is. I think this is the reception area. So what you've got, you've got one wall is the sort of back of the gatehouse and another wall yeah. is the front of the house oh so right see. i see that's how oh, it works again. yeah and uh interesting rooms oh yeah i remember seeing this room when i visited i was, I was really struck by it the ceiling is incredible it's called the panel room and the paneling yeah. was put in in the 1770s although it's designed to look older yeah, I mean, yeah. the ceiling is actually 19th century but again, oh, it seems to be based on an yes. Elizabethan uh, fantasy. Oh, yeah, it's very, uh, yeah, it's very, uh, that dark, dark aspect of the ceiling is not a, a typical 19th century thing at all, is it? No, no, no. But the ribs, 
uh, no, you can actually, you know, you're absolutely right. And this is a mixed match of styles, actually. <laughs> yeah. If you look at it, it's a bit of a hodgepodge of styles, but it looks very striking, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. It's a, it is very striking. Yeah. And what I like here about this particular uh, room here is if I was there, I would be terribly tempted. It says Morgans, and they've named a, a room after the Morgans. I'll yeah. be awfully tempted to just write at the top. Don't do graffiti, by the way. No, right, yeah. Last of the. <laughs> <laughs> that would be true, Sam Pierre. The last of the Morgans room. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And of course, the wonderful shot yeah. of the gatehouse that perhaps people know that, know Sam Pierre from the gatehouse rather than the house, I think now. Is that yeah. fair? I, I think so. It's, a, it's the primary way you seem to access it, isn't it, if you're walking? And just to tie up loose ends, uh, again, that's a little Sam Pierre. This is the Moynes Court gatehouse, different style. I wanted to show the older yeah. Moynes Court gatehouse, and that's where you can actually stay if you see mm. fit and rent it as a holiday home. Mm. So that's Saint Pierre. It was an interesting dart around legends and history and ages. Yeah, it? it's interesting, isn't it? Well, I think what you were saying about, I mean, I think the, the interesting thing about, oh, back to the interesting thing about legends is they are part of the history of the place. We don't, you can't sort of separate them. Um, they may not be historically accurate. In fact, they probably aren't. But, but but they are part of the history of the stories that the families and the places told about themselves. Mm. So it tells you what the region and what the people themselves thought about the, the roots of their history and thought about their position within that spread of the narrative of, of an area. So it's not, no, though they, though they have no historical mm. um, validity most of the time, it does sell you something very interesting about the psychology of, of the way the families and the way the areas root those families within themselves and the tra traditions that they step the step you know they steps back into you know so they're always worth worth keeping an eye on because they tell you yeah they tell you something in addition to the actual facts of the thing they tell you about that human perception of of yeah. themselves yeah and again it, there is an overlap as well isn't there uh, romance <laughs> Uh, romance up real history. I mean, that's in the case of hmm. Tudrig, he appears to have been a real historical figure. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of them were. I mean, I mean, it's like you look at St. Um, Grinclou, St. Mean, Wallace. Yeah. They are they are actual historical figures. Yeah. But they, they have their lives of saints and they have their stories and the miracles and all the things that are associated. And But at, at the core baseline of it, there is an authentic individual who occupied that thing. Yeah, it's interesting, and, if you look at St. Tudrig particularly, there's an awful lot of warlords around that period who spent a lot of time kicking seven sorts out of each other, who eventually then, well, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to retire to a monastery for a while. <laughs> Try and make, make a deal with it. And eventually, you know, you get a, you get a bit of a sainthood tapped on top of you. And, and, we're not, uh, yeah. that was it. and we are not <laughs> going down this particular holy well because yeah. um, um, his, Tudrig's grandson, I believe, was called... Arthwis, dangerously close to Arthur. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> and so yeah. we get all oh, those yeah. myths and all oh, those yeah. legends. I mean, well, there's a whole story to be told about our Arthurian obsessions within Grain, aren't there? There's a lot Absolutely. of Absolutely. But on right. that I mean, note... it's just, you know, with the Lewises, though, you go right back to, you know, their independence of thought and they're almost you know, deliberately standing aside from whatever the prevailing thought was. You're right back to the very start. You get... You get Morgan Applebaum and so and so, and then you get somebody with an completely different name. I'm no, not doing it's... that. I'm going to be Philip of Saint Pierre. <laughs> and maybe those Lewis are still going. If and they stuck like some. that all the way through. Oh yeah, and if the last yeah. of the Morgans is out there, we'd Let be us know. very happy to find out. Yeah. And on that note, we have to go. So ah. thank you very much for watching, and we shall be back soon. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye.